am blessed to be before you today. Um, <clears throat> very short notice, but God says, what, be in, ready in season and out of season. When is your season and when it ain't your season? Because when you think it's not your season, it just may be your season. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So you must be ready. Amen. Well, I got a, God, God did put a word in me. I've been, I've, I've been kind of, uh, man. Uh, incubating this word. Amen. And uh, I pray that it's delivered today. Uh, because it's, 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 it's appropriate for what is going on in the house. And what God is about to do. It's, it's sort of a prophetic word. Because God said this is what he's about to do in this house. Because some of you are aware that Pastor is talking continually about changes. About, about order. About going forward. And doing a new thing. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so the title of this message today is The Carpenter's Tools. If I had a subtitle, I would call it Unless God Builds the House. Unless God Builds the House. The builders build in vain. Amen? Hmm. Unless, unless God builds the house. They labor in vain. And except Jehovah, amen, keeps the city, the watchman watcheth in vain. The carpenter's tools. In John 9 and 4, Jesus said, I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. Because the night come and no man can work. That, that scripture used to puzzle me a lot, and I think of night and day. You know, you get up in the morning at 7 o'clock, and you go to work. You get off at 6, it's nighttime, you, you go to bed. <laughs> you know, while it, you work while it's day, and because the night come, no man can work. But there's a lot. Jesus said, my words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, we just can't look at things that, everything in the natural. We just can't take every word in the Bible literally. Because there's a spiritual connection to it. Do the work of the Lord while it's day. While it's light. While it's bright. While you have life in you. While you have light in your eyes. Because the night will come when you're in the grave and you can't do no work. Amen. And Jesus said, I must work the work of him that sent me. While it is day. Because the night comes. And no man can work. Jesus made this confession. And it has not changed. It has not changed for him. It has not changed for us. Amen. And so he came to do a work of the Lord. And he came to do a work in us. He came to work a work in us. Because we are his workmanship. Amen. And so as we submit to the work. See, and we become joint laborers with him, then the house can be built and God's purposes can be accomplished. Amen. There was a time when I was building a church and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, what are you doing? And took me to a scripture uh, that said, who do men say I am? And the disciples said, some say you are Peter, some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets. And he said, but who do you say I am? And Peter spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood has not given you this, but my father which is in heaven. He said, upon this rock, not Peter as some people say, but upon this truth, upon this truth, I will build my church. And I read the scripture. He said, read it again. I read it again. He said, read it again. I read it about five times. I said, okay, God, what are you trying to show me? He said, you're trying to build a church. That's not your job. He said, that's my job. He said, I will build my church. Amen. And he also said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. We can go on with that. Amen. And so right now, Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that I decrease and you increase in me, Lord God. 
Anoint our ears today, Lord God, that we may hear what you're telling us today. God, anoint our eyes that we may see in the spirit realm what you desire us to see, Lord God. And prepare our hearts for the planning of this word, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. The carpenter's tools. Now, a carpenter has many tools, amen? Carpenters build. Now, for those, this is a word for those who are going through something. Anybody going through something? Anybody got any hardships, personal, family, financial, on your job, in the church, in your marriage? Sometimes it seems like there is no way out or there is no end. And we cry out, Lord, how long? Amen? How much more can I bear? But there's a verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 said, the Lord will not put on you more than you can bear. You see? But with that temptation, he will make a way for your escape. See, God doesn't even allow the burden to come to you unless he attaches and escape with it. You know how when you send an email and you put an attachment on it? You see, he won't even allow that burden to come to you until there's an attachment of an escape for you. But we got to see, we got to see that. See, when you get an email, you get an attachment. It don't, you, you read the email, but you have to click on the attachment to open it up. So he'll send you, an, he send you a, 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 a way of escape. But if you focus so much on your burden, you fail to see the escape. Some people look at the email, they don't even look down there to see they have an attachment. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone right there. Amen. Let me get back to my lesson here. Because, uh, you know. Um, and so, how much did Jesus bear? And if the same spirit dwelt in him, now dwells in you, how much can you bear? See, we can bear much more than we think. Because we really don't know what's in us. Hmm. What's that? I can go on with that because I can show you an example of what I'm saying that you don't know really what's in you. Remember Adam in the garden? See, Adam, we all know Adam named all the animals. Right? And then growing up in the church of God in Christ, you know, reading the Bible, I always think that Adam just went around the garden saying, okay, that's an elephant, that's a giraffe, that's a monkey, and that, you know, this, that, and the other. But as I got older, as the Bible says, when I became a man, I put away foolish things, and I studied for myself. And the word actually says God brought the animals to Adam to see what he would call it. You see? He brought that, and he said, Give this a name, my son. He said, elephant. Okay, good. Name this here. Giraffe. Oh, you're doing good. Name this. Oh, rhinoceros. What are these things over here? Flowers. But you see, son, there are different varieties. Okay, that's a rose. That's a tulip. There's a carnation. Okay, you're doing good. Name, give this a name. Oh, those are monkeys. Oh, there are different kinds. Okay, spider, orangutan. He started naming all these things. See, and what I'm trying to tell you is that Adam didn't even know he could do this. So the Bible says God brought the animals. So God brought the opportunity to draw out the potential that he already placed there. He does the same thing. that God said, I, I change not. The same thing he done for Adam, he'll do for you. He brings you opportunities to draw out potential that he already placed in you. Oh, but wait a minute. Don't stop there now. Don't get too happy. Because the rest of that scripture said whatever, whatever Adam called it, that's what it was. So what are you calling your opportunity? Yes. Selah. I'll rest right there. What are you going to call your opportunity? Yes. Amen. 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 Let me get back to my lesson. <laughs> Amen. Some people may not be going through nothing right now. Amen. But, it, but, but you may have been through something. And sometimes you go through things, you say, well, I'm glad that's over. You know, I, 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 don't, I really don't know why it happened. You may still have questions. God, what was the purpose of that? I got through it, but why did you allow this? Amen? You may be even receiving some counseling on it. 
you know, talking to others, talking to your pastor, talking to your friends, you know, in the word of God, reading about, you know, all his promises, the edification, the uplifting of scriptures, encouraging words and passages from God's word. And that is good. Never fail to consult the word of God. Amen. And so this message or this teaching right here is on discipline. Oh, but wait a minute. We don't like that word, do we? Okay, uh, how about judgment? No, we don't want to hear about judgment neither, do we? But how many know that if you are a child of God, you're going to receive some discipline and some judgment in your life? Amen? God said judgment is going to start in the house of God. He said if you judge yourself, you won't be judged. Hmm. I didn't come to stroke your spiritual egos today. Okay? But to deliver words of truth. That you may mature and live in a life abundantly. Okay? Uh, I have a couple of scriptures I I gave. That is, put up Isaiah 55, 8. 8 and 9. Amen? It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, said the Lord. <laughs> See, many of us know God's acts. We know what's in his hand. We know what we can get from him. We know what he's got, and we want it. But see, but most of the time, we fail to understand his heart. We fail to understand his ways. And what he desired for us. Because see, if we understand his ways, a lot of time, the things that's in his hand, we, we won't just seek that all the time. Because we learn to endure. Amen. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Go to Proverbs 3. I just want to share these scriptures for you to lay a foundation here. Isaiah 3, 11, and 12. I'm sorry, Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 11, 12. I'm sorry. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. There it is. Neither be weary of his correction. 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected. Even as the father, the son in whom he delighted. Who don't correct their sons or daughters? And you do it because you love them. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 94. (laughs) Psalms 94. (laughs) Psalms 94. Psalms, Proverbs. Blessed is the man whom thou chasest, O Lord, and teaches him out of thy law. So a lot of times we get chased by the Lord and we feel like a stepchild. Because we don't understand it. But the scripture said, blessed is the man whom the Lord chases. Revelations 3, 19, 20. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous and therefore and repent. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and I will sup with him and he with me. Strange things about that scripture right there. And y'all sorry, sometimes I, I, I go off on a little track because I hear things from God as I'm, as I'm talking about things. You guys seen this picture of Jesus standing at the door? Right? Shepherd with his staff and says he's knocking at the door. I don't know if some of you may have re- realized this already, but the next time you see that picture, pay attention to the door. There's no door knock. Because he can't open it. You have to open it. Amen. And the last scripture, uh, Brother Thaddeus, or 
Hugh, I'm sorry. Hebrews 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteth, and scourges every son whom he receives. Next verse. This is 7 and 8, yeah. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chases not? In the last verse. Because if ye be without chastisement, wherefore are ye all are partakers? Then are ye bastards and not sons. Some of us don't want to go through nothing, do we? <laughs> anyway, uh, so we know that we will be chastened by the Lord. Amen? By our Father. Why? Because he loves us. His ways are not our ways. So we don't always understand the chastening. The children don't always understand why you got so mad. Because the light came on and they were still outside. <laughs> so sometimes we don't understand the correction. But because we do not consider his ways, that's why we don't understand it. We're not considering the ways of the Lord. We all have a part of God's master plan. Amen. His blueprint. See, a carpenter, before he builds a house, he has a blueprint. He sees the whole house before he even gets started. And we're all a part of that master plan. Amen? And that plan fulfills his purposes. Because his purpose and his mission is to build his church. Not a church but his church. And when you surrender to his will, you have no say in where you ought to be used. Amen? Because see, here's some of us, here's what some of us do at one time or another. We will take our own desire and try to merge it with God's will. Amen? Amen? That's one extreme. The other side of that coin is we would take God's will and we pick and choose what we're going to do and not do. Mm -hmm. See, one extreme to the next. But in the middle of that is what? Surrender. And surrender all. In that order. Huh? <laughs> See, but but even Jesus, our Lord, Savior, Healer, Banner, Rock, Redeemer, he confessed to the Father, not my will, but thy will be done. So let's consider the carpenter. Jesus is the master carpenter, amen? And he's the carpenter of our lives. Matthew 6, 13 says, upon this rock, I will build my church. The master contractor comes to build a house in us. You know, you guys are hurt. You are the church. So if you are the church, unless the Lord builds the house, you build it in vain. Because if he's not building it, you're building it. But in order for something to be built, many times where there's something old there already, it has to be torn down. That old has to be torn down. There has to be a new foundation laid. And how many know when you see how tall skyscrapers and tall buildings, that means they had to go deep in the ground. But the deeper they go, the higher they can build up. Some, some of y'all will get that later. 
<laughs> uh, see, some old houses have basements. Mm. Old foundations and basements. And them basements hold what? Termites? Spiders? Creepy things? Uh, spider webs? Leaky faucets? Leaky pipes? And what else? Water is damp. Hmm? And so a lot of that stuff has to be uprooted. That's your old life. That's your life that holds secrets. See, how many times, you know, something that you had, and you, you just don't want to throw it away. You're not using it. But you don't want to throw it away. It holds some memory from way long back. So you take it down in the basement and you put it there. <laughs> See, you, you're holding on to the past. Hmm. In your basement. And you know it's there, but you don't show it to nobody. I know, I'm... I'm <laughs> But let's get back to the carpenter. See, y'all get me going off on the different things here. The carpenter has many tools, amen? A carpenter uses many tools. And the tools, or let me say this, and it's at his discretion which tool he uses to, for a particular job. Although most tools are designed for a particular thing. But the carpenter decides what tools are to be used. The tool don't decide, use me. <laughs> tools have no say so which one ought to be used. But they do have, they are designed for a particular work. And so are you. So are you. Now to build a building, a carpenter needs supplies. Not just tools, but he needs supplies. Okay? There are a variety of supplies available to the carpenter. Let's say I got a list of them here. You have, um, uh, you have, you have saws. You have, no, those are, I mean, you have, let me look at, look at my notes here now. Um, let me back up. I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, let's discern between tools and, and supplies. Spiritually, tools are usually situations. Let me put it that way. Tools are situations. Okay? Circumstances. Forces of this world. And even people. Tools are the carpenter. The supplies are usually in the natural. There's sheet rock. Nails. Wood. Two by fours. Tile. Brick, carpet, molding, these type of things, right? These are supplies. Hmm, right. Now, supplies, spiritually, disobedience, attitudes, desires, soulish and fleshly needs, Now, each of these supplies is something all by itself, whether it's, a, whether it's a piece of wood, whether it's a nail, whether it's a rock, whether it's a brick. All these things are something within itself, but they are not the house. And each of these things need to be brought together in order to build. Amen? Amen. Yet the house is not made by simply bringing them together in one place. Some work must be done. You just can't bring all these things to a lot and say, boom, there it is. There's a house. There's some work that needs to be done. Amen? Now, the supplies are almost always, if you haven't guessed it by now, us. We are usually the supplies. The nail, the sheetrock, the wood, the doorknob, the chandelier, 
the carpet. These, we, that's, those are usually us. If I could put this in a metaphorical situation to bring it to a now situation and a right now time. Amen? The house is usually, I mean, the suppliers are usually us. Members that make up the body of Christ. The church is what the carpenter is building. Amen? Now, our focus tonight is on one tool. I'm not going to focus on all the tools. I have a series of all the tools. But tonight, we're going to focus on one tool. Or this morning, excuse me. This morning, we're going to focus on one tool, and that's the hammer. Amen? Amen? The hammer. The hammer is designed to pound, to beat, to drive a nail through wood. Amen? Amen? But from the nail perspective, that's you. <laughs> See, the hammer is a circumstance in life. The hammer is a tool. These are circumstances in life. These are situations. It could be even another person. That's the God's tools. But the supply as a nail is you. And this tool, this circumstance, is hammer is designed to pound and beat and drive a nail through a piece of wood. Amen? A lot of pressure. A lot of pounding. Okay, uh, may I have two volunteers? Diggs and Bishop. I want to show you something. Show you what this looks like. Diggs is a nail. Kind of hard here. <laughs> That's my brother. I'm a piece of wood. That is a piece of wood. God is building a house. So in order to get me and Doug fastened together to form a foundation, he's going to use this nail to pound in me, to beat in me, to drive through me, right? Until Doug and I become one. Right? And the will of the carpenter is done. Sometimes God uses another person to fasten you to something else. See, man, it don't feel good. It don't look good. And you say, why are you doing this to me? But God is trying to build something in the house. You can sit down now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Now I want to show you something though. How many times? How many? How many, how many times you've seen a, a nail, driving a nail into a piece of wood and the wood split? Yes. See, sometimes the integrity of the wood is not secure. But even more so, how many times have you seen a nail bend? Amen? You hear my nail, nail being? See, remember you a nail. See, that's a nail that don't submit to the will of the hammer. Because he being. Oh, some of y'all getting this, huh? They bend before they submit. So what happens? The carpenter will flip that hammer around and just pull that nail out and eject it and throw it over on the floor. I'm, I'm just glad God don't use us that, that arbitrarily, okay? I'm glad he just don't do us just like that. But the point I'm making is that the nail would do good to submit to the hammer. Because how many times have you ever had a nail that bent and it's over here, but you need another nail and you go get that nail and you put it on the concrete and you turn it over where the hump is this way and you take a hammer and you tap, 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 and you straighten it out. So you're going to take a beating. You might want to take it in the beginning or you're going to take it in the end, but you're going to take a beating. 
So it's, it's better to submit to the will of the carpenter and become part of the house. Mm. My, my, my. I'm glad Jesus don't treat us like, like, like we treat them nails sometimes. Amen. Because his love for us goes beyond our understanding. Yes, yes. And so the way, we, so he, he'll forgive us. And he'll straighten us out when we don't bend, when we don't submit to his will. When we bend, when we moan, when we complain, when we murmur. I want to pray about this some more. Hmm? But God still loves you. And he'll straighten, and he'll straighten you out. But you're still going to take a tapping. He's going to tap you out. He'll straighten you out. If not, if not, if, if, if not, if you still don't submit to the being straightened it out, you're just going to lay there on the sideline. Because a bent nail is of no use. I tell you, God, God, God is trying to build something here in TCI. Stop blaming others for the decision you made. Amen. Hmm? You know, God is trying to straighten you out, trying to tap you out. And you saying, this all happened because of her. Because you didn't want to submit to the going through the wood. But I mean, no, we all can't be wood. <laughs> we all can't be wood. And everybody's not a nail. See, one thing I like about this, God said, you know, it says, you are the church. But see, but, and, and, and I know we said that, and, and I know what we mean, but if we want to just get down to the truth, no, we're not the church. We're only a part of the church. Hmm. One of you may be a paneling. Another may be carpet. Another may be a doorknob. A ceiling fan. But everybody want to be the beautiful chandelier in the foyer. <laughs> you know everybody want to have the gold handrail going up the stairs but everybody can't be that you're only a part of the house hmm. amen And you won't be effective in the kingdom of God. With that old nature. The basement. Living on top of that basement. Allow God to renovate. That's a good word. Renovate. Because see, Jesus came, and I'm off my message again, but not really. Because Jesus came, he only had one mission. And I'm not surprised that I'm stopping to say this because I say this all the time. This is, this is, this is part of the kingdom message. Jesus only had one mission. He only had one message. When he went into the wilderness and was tempted and he came out, he preached his flagship message that said what? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Right here. Not in the by and by. At hand. It's before you. You're looking at it. 
Now, everything else he did, whether he opened the eyes of the blind, raised the dead, made the lame to walk, turned the water to wine, was to show them the kingdom was at hand. Amen? I'm glad to see my wife coming in this morning. And uh, I, I would like to say that, I would like to stop right now and say that today is our anniversary. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. Happy anniversary, sweetheart. I love you, too. You know we got people in here, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So in order to be effective in the kingdom of God, you've got to get rid of that old nature. You've got to be renovated. And what I was saying about the word renovated is that Jesus' message and his mission was to reestablish the kingdom of God on earth. I know some of you probably never heard that or never heard it like that before. Let me say it again. Jesus' message and mission was singular, and it was to reestablish the kingdom of God on earth. You know, in the word, he is the second Adam, right? Why? Because God had already established the kingdom in Adam. Why do you think he was able to name everything? He had the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And, and what we're trying to get, Adam already had. But he lost it. Jesus is called the second Adam because he came to reestablish the kingdom of God on earth. Let me give you a nugget. We come from earth. So in, before God can establish the kingdom of God on earth, he had to establish it in earth. My, my, my. Because why? Because he gave man dominion. And everything he does on the earth, he do it through man, kind. So if he wanted to reestablish his kingdom on earth, he first had to get his kingdom in the earth. No, Jesus said, there'll be a time when men say, Lo, look here, and Lo, look there, there's the kingdom. He said, but don't go there because the kingdom is within you. And how, what does that look like? How does the kingdom get it come to you? Okay, we know it's by the Holy Spirit. But let me give you a, a metaphor again. Something that we can wrap. See, Jesus said first in the natural, then in the spiritual. He gives us things in the natural. We understand things in the natural. And in the natural, there are direct connection to things in the spiritual. Because if we don't understand the natural things, we'll never understand spiritual things. So he says, a king must have territory in order to rule. Amen? That's in the natural. A king needs territory to rule. Right? And once the king establishes or conquers or have possession of territory, he steps into his territory. And once he steps into his territory and he starts exacting his will, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I want this here and this there. He's exacting his will. Now it's just not looked on as a territory anymore. Now this is his domain. Domain. It's in the natural. That's his, his, his domain. See, we all have a domain. It's where you live. It's where your stuff is. That's your domain. So when the king steps into the territory, exacts his will, and now the territory is called a domain, what do you have? You have a king in a domain, a king domain, a king dumb. When you allow God to step into your territory, see, you're nothing but dirt. When you allow God to step into your territory, and exact his will in your life, kingdom comes to you. Simple. Simple. And true. See, 
So to get back to the carpenter, we must allow ourselves to be renovated. Here's that word again, renovated. In the kingdom, in Jesus' mission to reestablish the kingdom, look at all the words that are associated with kingdom. Restore. Revive. Redeem. Give me another one. Huh? Repent. What do all these words have in common? Re. Means to do again. Means to do over. Why? Because it was done before. In Adam. And Christ came to reestablish. To restore. To redeem. The kingdom of God. On earth. But before he could do it on earth. He has to do it in earth. Because God gave us dominion. And he will not take it away. So we have jobs to do. And nails have jobs to do. Piece of sheetrock has a job to do. So you may see a piece of sheetrock on that wall over there. That sheetrock does not stand up there all by itself. It's got some wood behind it and some nails behind it and some glue behind it and some tape behind it. It's got a whole lot of other stuff behind it to help it stand up like that. And the same thing has to happen in this church. We must all understand that God is using us to build his church, to build a nucleus here that will give him glory, that will exact his will. That will help people to see God, to come to God, to repent, to be saved. An oasis that people will come to. Something different that people say, what is going on over there? Amen. Because he said, he who is in Christ is what? A new creature. And the scripture says, he who is in Christ, but it also goes to say, he who Christ is in. Amen. See, we, all, we, we always want to say, I want to get into the word. But is the word in you? Amen. You can get into the word all you want. But is the word in you? Amen. Now, you can read the word. The letter kill it. You can read the word, but if the word is not, if you're not living the word, yeah. see, there's another thing. That, that in John 1 and 1, it says, in, uh, um, <laughs> in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and everything that was made was made by him. And then, that's another teaching, but in the 14th verse, it says, and the word became flesh. Well, remember, God doesn't change. He still desires the word to become flesh in you. In you. He wants the word to be in your flesh. He wants the word to come in to be lived in your life. So that you live the word, you walk the word, you talk the word, you think the word. The word becomes flesh. And it will dwell among people and they will deceive, discern him not. Just like Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and try to close this up. Because I feel contractions coming. 1 Peter 4.17 says the time has come. Can you put that on the screen? 1 Peter 4 and 17. First Peter 4, for the time is come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them 
that obey not the gospel of God. Now, he's not talking about something in the future. He's not talking about something in the by and by. He's talking about now. Right now. Do y'all know the gospel of now? Some of y'all do. I've, I've shared the gospel of now with some of you. The gospel of now. Now is a word that means this present moment. Right? It means right now. There's a scripture that says, now the just shall live by faith. There's another scripture that says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Um, and so when you say now, okay, everybody say now. now. Say it again. Now. Say it like you mean it. Now. Every time you say now, you update it from the last time you said it. So it don't matter what happened yesterday, last week, last month, last year. You said now the just shall live by faith. Now there's no condemnation in those who love Christ. It don't matter what the enemy is trying to show you how you messed up before. You said now. Every time you said now, you update it and you, and you break the devil's back. Now. God is a God of now. Although he knows the future, he can look in your future, but he deal with you in the now. Now the time has come. That judgment will come into the house of God. Now judgment is not always a bad thing. See, because I'm talking about judgment, because I'm talking about chastising, everybody trying to put some books down in their pants and trying to, you know, trying to put on more clothes. You know how you used to do when mama going, you know, mama going to whoop you? You know, because you know, you know what I'm saying? You're trying to get more stuff around you so so that it don't hurt so much. <laughs> but judgment, the judgment I'm talking about is a type of pruning kind of judgment. Amen. The purpose of pruning is to expedite growth. See, a tree is pruned to produce the desired results. You cut a little bit here so that more can grow out. Amen? It's, 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 it's beneficial to the tree because it promotes a bountiful harvest. It produces more fruit. Actually, in plants, there are two types of pruning. There's a corrective pruning and a maintenance pruning. Corrective pruning is a process of chastening. Its purpose is to punish in order to correct. Amen? The maintenance pruning is the upkeep. To keep us on the right path and to mold us into all that God has called us to be. So the chastening and the judgment that God will bring is for our growth. Why? Because he loves you. Because he wants you to produce. Because he wants you to be productive. Because he wants you to be effective ministers. Effective Christians. I mean, it's one thing just to be a Christian. It's one thing just to be a good speaker. It's one thing to be a good anything. But are you effective? Are you, are you producing any results? Are you changing any lives? Are you affecting or infecting anybody else's life? Yeah. See, sometimes we need to just get, just infect folks. You know, get contagious. <laughs> get radical. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? When you was out there in the world, now y'all looking at me like, what are you talking about? Now y'all was radical. You know it is to be radical. You was radical in the club. Can't, you can't be radical for Christ. Hmm? Go all out for Christ. Hmm? However, many, many corrective and maintenance pruning, the, the, the execution, they both feel the same because you're cutting something away. <laughs> Something's being cut away. It may hurt, but it won't hurt long. Weeping endure for a night. 
But joy comes in the morning. Amen. So cutting something away that's a part of you, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. It may hurt. But most people think judgment comes from a result of sin. In other words, if, you, if, you weren't, <laughs> if we weren't in sin, you wouldn't be receiving this judgment. Remember Job's friends came to him that way? You know, Job, you must have done something. Why don't you just confess it? You know? <laughs> Well, see, the word tells us that judgment will start in the house of God. Amen. And it rains, R-A-I-N-S, and in parentheses, R-E-I-N-G. It rains on the just and the unjust. See, judgment comes because of sin, not because of sins. See, when you see in the Bible the word sin, that's the sin nature that we all have that was caused by Adam's downfall. It's a sin nature. But sins is an act that may be done. So judgment doesn't come because of sins, because God will forgive your sins, but you still have a sin nature. And judgment comes to correct that so that you can be more and more like Christ. And I've come to realize that judgment, God's judgment, righteous judgment, is always God's way of dealing with his people. It's always his way of dealing with his people. Psalms 9 and 16 says that God is known by his judgments. Quite often we don't understand God's ways of executing his word. And there are periods in your growth, when that's okay that you don't understand. That's why we need to learn to trust him for those times when we don't have any understanding of what's going on. But we have to know that he is in charge. That he will make a way for your escape. You just got to look for that way. You got to look to him to find that way. You can't look within yourself to find a way of escape. You can't look in your fellow man or, or, or sister to find a way for that escape. You have to look to God to find that attachment. So many people have been burdened down. I mean down. Saying, well, God put this on me. I must get bad. I'm going to sit here till my chain come. <laughs> but the word of God doesn't say that. It says, with the temptation, with the burden, he will make a way for your escape. Bing, you got mail. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I won't belabor this any further. I hope you got something out of this. Amen. I hope some, something that was said uh, made a difference in your thinking. Because, see, your thinking determines your belief. Your belief determines your behavior. So we must start thinking right. I want every child of God to raise your hand.